hundreds of flights a day. Our max altitude of a detected drone is actually over 4,000 higher than they're allowed Believe to. Believe it or not, as soon as you turn on the drone, the system is going to pick up the signal. And watch a live replay of that drone, enhance situational awareness around the stadium or a large area like an entire county. county, 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 county. In this video, we're going to present a very powerful technology that has the potential of having a positive impact in catching bad actors with drones. While this is not available to the public in the wrong hands, it could be seen as an invasion of privacy. This tech has the ability to locate drones and their pilots, determine how high you're flying, and also record all of that data. While we are very excited about the technology aspect of it, we're also somewhat concerned. This is not remote ID, but it certainly resembles a lot of the criteria that the FAA has in the remote ID as proposed by the FAA right now. As you watch this video, please, please, please remember, do not shoot the messenger. So now we're back inside. We set this thing up on the outside and uh, we've been having a discussion on several things and I wanted to share some of that information with you guys. And, and first off, Brendan, can you tell us a little bit more about kind of the purpose of this device. Obviously, we have a lot of people out there, myself included, that doesn't want to always be watched on what we do, but there is a purpose, there is a reason why we need this kind of devices out. Absolutely, so really at a core of what we do at Aerial Armor is providing situational awareness about drone activity. For the majority of our clients and use cases for our systems, you know, there is a security aspect to it whether it be an NFL stadium or critical infrastructure, it's important for security personnel to be aware of drone flights that are taking place in those areas. So really at the core of it, it's, it's a situational awareness and, and understanding where you may have authorized or unauthorized drone traffic taking place. So some of your clients may be also airports. What, what kind of data are, is really interested in, in picking up at different airports? Sure, you know, at the core of it, once again, it's gonna be that increased situ situational awareness but using these types of systems also provide an opportunity for education. You know, our intent is not to get people arrested or uh, have security go out and prevent them from doing what they want to do, but having that opportunity to know where the pilot's at, mm -hmm. giving security or law enforcement an opportunity to go speak with that person. Um, you know, maybe it's an authorized flight that they were unaware of, or maybe there's a situation where um, education is warranted. Uh, using our systems, it gives our clients the opportunity to um, manage potential threats by having that additional information. Yeah, and, and, and we all know not everybody is out there to be bad with their drone. We have a lot of people that are uneducated, so to me this is a great way to get after these people. Um, you know, we have, uh, we're in Arizona, we have forest fires. I can see this being the perfect example where we can go and find someone who may be flying their drone, doesn't know that there's a forest fire in the area and stopping operation. That's really expensive, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, you think about a tanker that's prevented from doing its job, putting out a fire. There could be millions of dollars worth of damage that happens, whether that's to, um, you know, the forest area or even homes that the fires may be encroaching on. So uh, it's really important, once again, to really just provide that situational awareness for our clients, whether that's law enforcement or uh, those in the private industry to uh, understand, once again, the drone flights are taking place, but more importantly, where the pilot's at so they can have an opportunity to uh, speak with them. Yeah, remember, don't be that guy. We say that every single week when we talk about our news updates. Uh, if you wonder when somebody flies during the Super Bowl how this gets picked up, this is exactly how the, the information is going to get picked up. Something similar, they have different systems obviously in place for that. But let's go ahead and take a look at what the software kind of sees, and I'm sure you have questions about this and, and, and figuring out exactly what kind of data is available. So let's jump in and, and take a look. Sounds good. Yep, we right. took off. So with oh, LT, yeah. So we'll kind of wait till he goes around. Whoa. You know, this is going to be an example of a live detection. This is an actual flight that's taking place outside. Um, on the screen, we're able to see various information about the drone being detected. So over here on the left-hand side, we can obviously see a picture of the drone. That helps kind of assess threat level, right? If you have a Matrice 600 flying over your facility yeah. versus a Mavic Mini, that may change your, um, um, a, you know, quickness to respond, yeah. right? Um, so we have that. We also have pretty much all of the telemetry data that you would see on the drone itself. So mm -hmm. altitude, speed, heading, we get the serial number yep. uh, and some other information here. So we can see details about this flight down here at the bottom. Um, 
Here we have kind of some of that raw telemetry data. So in addition to the drone's live location flying through time and space, we get the GPS coordinates of the launch point or home location as mm -hmm. it's referred to within the software. Uh, and then we also get the location of the pilot, which is where the handset for this drone would be. So this allows us kind of two different points to um, locate the pilot, right? Yeah. As you're familiar with drones and most of you guys as well, the home point is generally where the pilot's going to be located. But in certain situations, you may have pilots that get into vehicles or Start move for around. whatever reason, and we're able to track that as well. Hey, Taylor, can you uh, start moving around yourself, uh, maybe along the uh, the mall side right there? So that's his little yep, he is. his little green, uh, green person. Yeah. There we go, he's moving now. Absolutely, yeah. So we have different icons that represent uh, the different pieces of telemetry. Obviously, a little red drone, that's going to indicate where the drone's at, the blue home point location, and yeah. then you have the pilot's icon as well which will move around as he w physically walks around. And he's, oh, there you go, he went all the way out there. So sure. he's, uh, he's flying with the uh, smart controller right now, the Air 2S. So that's uh, all that data is getting captured, which is really interesting because there is that, that is not connected to the internet. Correct. So it, yeah, we can see. You can see the speed in here, 37 miles an hour right now. He's moving at about 57 feet and then all the coordinates are being recorded at the same time. So now there's no private information in here because that was never entered anywhere in the system. Correct, yeah, you know, the point about this, uh, you know, process in general is that we're not seeing the encrypted video, we're not getting any personally identifying information. Um, for this system to operate within the confines of the law, it's important that we don't get any information. However, um, law enforcement can use a subpoena to DJI with your serial number and potentially get some identifying information depending on how the drone was purchased or registered. If through, it was registered through DJI. Through, through, through DJI yeah. or the FAA as well, right? If, if the serial number is registered and law enforcement is looking into it, they can make it a query through the yeah. FAA uh, channels to see what drone, uh, who, who might belong to. So this is very much like remote ID, that has been published, right? The same type of information that we will get eventually from remote ID, from a module or from a remote ID drone. Exactly, and to be honest, this system was originally designed as a as remote, remote ID, ID. Solu mm -hmm. solution. DJI wanted to come to the market years ahead of everyone else to show this is how you can do it, it's easy, we can set up a simple process for communication to where all new drones can communicate to mm -hmm. it. You don't need any additional hardware on the drones themselves, yep. uh, depending on uh, the type of onboard computing capabilities, but it works exactly that way. We're able to track the drone, we're able to see it. What we also do here is analyze historical information. So down at the bottom, we're gonna be able to see immediately if we have any historical data on your drone. So in a lot of our deployments that have been year long or longer, mm -hmm. we can very immediately assess threat level by understanding how many other times has this drone been detected and where has it been detected. Mm -hmm. We actually have a very sophisticated risk al algorithm that looks at several different factors to potentially point out higher risk flights, and we can get into that a little bit later. Yeah. But um, using that historical data, we can also attach comments. So let's say we have a repeat offender at a stadium, he's been talked to, but he keeps coming back and flying. Mm -hmm. We can um, make comments in the system to tag that as an unfriendly uh, and get specialized alerting, but also a let that, who, that operator know um, who's watching the screen here that it's a, a drone that we've already encountered. Can you communicate with the drone? No. no. So this system is 100% passive. Yeah. We're just listening to those signals that the DJI drones are, are passing out there um, and, and getting the information from them. Yeah, so if you're wondering if somebody can take over your drone and, and, and control it and then land it somewhere else, not really something that at this stage is, uh, is a possibility. Well, you know, to be honest, it is a possibility through yeah. the use of other systems. Okay. In this case, we're looking at detection only through the aeroscope, mm -hmm. but um, we integrate several other systems on the mitigation side of the technology that does allow for uh, takeover or jamming or return to home, depending on the situation. Wow. Even a DJI drone, huh? Even DJI drones, yes. Wow. Hey, Taylor, let's go ahead and land for this guy right here, and then we're going to fly two drones at the same time. So if you guys can come pick up the uh, DJI FPV. 
All right, the next thing that I want to do is we're going to fly the um, DJI FPV in addition to the Air 2S so we can see the different tracks showing in here. Now you can see on our screen right now that we actually have a bit of, a, of an extended track. That's because, believe it or not, as soon as you turn on the drone, the system is going to pick up the signal. And what happened is that, well, it didn't have a full GPS location. So it kind of reset to a zero, zero location somewhere off our chart, which is that line that you see on the side here. But you were telling me earlier that actually this will pick up the drone before you even take off. So if you're in an area where you're not supposed to fly and like the Super Bowl, for example, you could get picked up before even taking off. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a great feature of the system. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're reading telemetry data from the drone itself. So when you're sitting there, you've turned it on, you have the IMU kind of initializing, we're already detecting the drone. So in a lot of situations, from a security perspective, it gives advanced notification that there may be a drone flight that's about to take about place. To take it, yep. Yeah, we've had a lot of success stories with some of our clients, especially within the stadium industry, where somebody's yeah, even sitting in their car, they've, tr they've turned their drone on, maybe during a football game, let's mm -hmm. say, and uh, maybe they're going through a firmware update or what have you, and they're able to actually send security or law enforcement to that person before they even get a chance to launch the drone. Yeah. And in this case, you know, increasing the safety for the people at the security yep. or at the stadium, rather. That makes sense. All right, let's get those guys off uh, off the ground. All right, you guys can go ahead and fly both airplane, uh, both aircraft at the same time. All right, so that's an alert. We actually set this up so that it gives us an alert. Um, an oral alert here on the uh, on the computer, but also we've been getting text messages. So I actually have a text message right here, two text messages because we have two aircraft that are flying. It says DJI Air 2S and FPV right here, where in the test zone number one that we set up. And I can actually even click on the screen in itself and it will take me to the location of where that flight is currently going on. So um, everything is, is happening right here for law enforcement, for example. Yeah, to, we, we, we really developed that feature to increase the response time or decrease the response time rather from a security or law enforcement perspective. Uh, we found there was a big bottleneck when you're running in a command center type environment mm -hmm. for somebody sitting and watching the screen and then disseminating that information to the proper authorities versus having all of the people who may be responsible to respond to that on a, uh, you know, a text message or email alert, that information gets disseminated instantly and you kind of cut down on that time. Because really at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times, especially around stadiums or places where people know they probably shouldn't be flying, mm -hmm. they're just going to put the drone up for a few minutes to get a picture. So uh, cutting down on the response time is important for us to, you know, increase the safety. To increase, yeah. Oh, we can see them flying. So we have one drone, another drone here. And I guess depending on which one you select. Correct. It, it shows you the different track. There you go. Yeah, so exactly. So, well, we, you know, you see both drones. Whichever one you're selecting, you know, in this case, we're kind of picking up the historical flight as well from this other drone here um, that we had just flown. Wow. Yes, yeah, so you can. So that's the FPV right now we're yep. looking at flying around. And then, uh, yeah, they're going over the dirt area back there. And then the Air 2S, you can see the historical data on the Air 2S. The previous flight is still on here. And then Taylor just went out. So, um, And so the uh, DJI FPV right now flying at... 10 miles an hour, 184 feet, and uh, seven miles. So he's flying around. Uh, we are not in a restricted area here around the, uh, the mall, so we can actually fly up to 400 feet AGL in this area. So, wow, oh, that's incredible. Look at that. And then, so the refresh rate, about what, one second, every one second? One to two seconds. It really depends on the quality of the environment from a radio frequency perspective. Mm -hmm. If you have a high RF environment, just like when you're flying a drone, yep. there may be challenges to your connectivity. Gotcha. And so from here, let's say that somebody else was flying uh, in a different area of town, we haven't really set up an area to detect. So we wouldn't see them or would they actually pop they on would. The screen. They yeah. Would pop on so the screen. in this case, the way our software works, it's going to display any detection within the detection range of the sensor. So okay. in most cases, we're getting 12 to 40 miles worth of range from this particular sensor. Yep. Very dependent on RF environment and um, also topography of yep. the installed area. But um, 
the way we minimize alerts, nuisance alerts, is by incorporating alert zones. So we may be detecting drones, you know, 12 to 40 miles away, but for our clients, they've only drawn specific alert zones around their areas of interest, yep. which will ultimately allow them to filter out some of the data they're not interested in yep. and focus on and the just go in that, absolutely in that the, area, area so, of interest. Um, you and I talked about uh, use cases. Give me some use cases of, of places where you've used this. We talked about the Fiesta for the balloons, for example. Let's talk about this and, and how this is helping to increase security around this type of event. Sure. So you have kind of your obvious ones, airports, any place there's air traffic, heliports, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we provide a yearly service at the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta uh, when they do have a, a variety of hot air balloons flying. It is actually the most photographed uh, event in the world, so oh, you, really? you can imagine there's going to be a lot of drones and there is a TFR yep. around a certain time. So we provide that situational awareness for them. The same would apply to an airport, right? You have uh, air traffic coming in and going, especially when there's passenger air traffic. You want to be sure that there's no drones potentially uh, causing an issue. So those are kind of the more common use cases. We also have seen really the rise of counter surveillance against law enforcement as one of a really... Um, um, important use cases because in certain organiza criminal organizations they're using drones to monitor police activity mm -hmm. whether that be um, you know maybe during a riot let's say watching police response and, and maybe diverting um, different crowds of people one way based on the way police are responding yep. or just you know maybe during the commission of a crime maybe there's a a burglary in progress mm -hmm. and they are using the drones just to keep an eye out to see if, if there's police Who's response. Yeah. So we've seen that um, probably most commonly um, across the United States in, in the last year mm -hmm. is, is, as probably the number one uh, uh, kind of criminal use of drones. Yep. So let's say that we had an event like the, the Fiesta and I'm allowed to fly in this area because I get approval to fly in the TFR. Can you whitelist my drone so it doesn't show up in here? Do you have a way to do this? Absolutely. Since we're tracking the unique serial number to the drone, yep. we're able to add that to a watch list if it's a sp suspicious drone, mm -hmm. or a whitelist if it's an authorized drone. So then it would disappear from the screen? No. Authorized flights can still represent a threat. Mm -hmm. For example, we have some major festival clients who put on these large music festivals, and uh, there, there's a production crew that's hired to do a specific job, and they may take the confines of their contract and push it a little bit to mm -hmm. get a cool shot. Um, and it's important for us to still retain information of these authorized flights. And so you mentioned that, that your company does uh, more than just provide these, uh, these, these boxes for people to detect. Can you talk a little bit more about the other side of what you guys do? Sure. So, you know, core part of our business is going to be providing these systems for permanent use, mm -hmm. like we mentioned, stadiums, airports. But we also have a large portion of our business that's service-based. So we go out to sporting events, concerts, like the, or like Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta air shows, and deploy this system or these multiple types of systems that we use on a one-off basis. Yep. You know, they may only need it for three days out of the year, and we go out with kind of a white glove service where we have a monitoring team on site that's working hand in hand with security to mm -hmm. you know provide that enhanced situational awareness without the client having to learn the system or to deploy it exactly obviously these systems are expensive can you give us an idea of the price range if, if somebody wanted to buy this yeah you know if we look at the variety of tools that we provide to detect drones you know we're starting anywhere around fifty thousand up to multi-millions of dollars wow. depending on the system you know currently we integrate radio frequency based systems uh, radar systems, camera systems, and then up to the mitigation as well for those uh, entities that are authorized to use that technology. Exactly. And then you also mentioned uh, the uh, idea of having uh, a permanent setup that you would set in the city, for example, and then providing access to that data to people who might want to not purchase the entire system but just have access to that data, right? Absolutely. So, you know, our company maintains a variety of citywide networks where we go and set up multiple nodes to detect drones within a large city. Mm -hmm. So most of the top cities in the United States right now, we have these networks where then we can cater to security organizations, law enforcement, um, and, and, and give access across a large area without them having to invest in the hardware. So they can simply come to us, we can issue an account, and they can access all this data without um, all of the back-end 
um, challenges that come with buying hardware and deploying it, we manage all of that piece of it. Gotcha. And it's important to note with this technology, this is not available to the general public. Yeah. It's very specific to law enforcement and security personnel. Yeah. Um, you know, we do not sell to private individuals, even if they may have a lot of money. This only goes to specific uh, security organizations, law enforcement, government. Um, you know, this data is not publicly available and we do not provide any of the information that we see to the general public. Yep. Yep. Let's talk about newer drones. Obviously, we have the Mavic 3 that's sitting right here. That's going to also get detected by the system. Um, is there anything special that you guys have to do on the back end when a new drone comes out? In most cases, the drone's going to detect right away, and that's an advantage of the Aeroscope system specifically. Uh, the way DJI built in the back end communication systems allows for all new drones to be instantly detected. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, we're actually detecting the drones before they're even publicly released. Because uh, as you know, DJI will send out a handful of yep. new drones to content creators and mm -hmm. allow them to test it and do videos. So a lot of times we will see uh, those new drones pop up. In some cases, the name is obscure. DJI does a good job of protecting their uh, you know, secrecy about new drones. but we're able to detect them without a software update, without a firmware update. So you don't really get a picture up here, you just get a, a yeah, question we may mark? Yeah, we might get a, yeah, some obscured name, but we know, hey, this is This, this is, is a new, new one. one. Yeah, it's like new cars right on the road when you see new cars being tested. All right, now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the software in itself, because there's a lot of things in the back end that can be done with this data, right? Correct, yeah, you know, we tend to look at this software and the data that we get as twofold. You have one side of the house that's live detections, it's going to be kind of primarily what we've been talking about. But the other side is data analytics and understanding trends and looking at data from a high level perspective. Mm -hmm. And we see the most success with this on our citywide deployments where, you know, over years worth of time, we're collecting all the flight information and we're able to analyze that uh, given an event of interest. So one of the main um, tools that we have built into the software, by the way, I do want to kind of step back a little bit and talk about this software. This is a in-house developed. Mm -hmm. um, we have basically from the ground up have taken um, the DGI framework and built it into our software, but then allowed integration of other sensors. As I've mentioned more than once before, we're not just using the Aeroscope. In most deployments, we have multiple sensor technologies. Yep. So being able to integrate those into one seamless command and control system, uh, it was important to our clients. You don't want to have multiple windows up in the command yep. center when you have a radar or uh, you know, a camera-based detection system. So we built it from the ground up to cater specifically to our clients' needs. And a lot of that was, once again, looking at the data analytics from the back end. So one of the um, most used uh, features we have here is alert zone summary. So as I mentioned, in most cases, we can detect way farther than our clients are interested in. Mm -hmm. um, in. In the example of a stadium, they only care about what's around the stadium. They mm -hmm. don't care what's happening 12 miles away. So in order to filter through that data from a historical spec perspective, we can use alert zones, draw areas of interest, and then query data just for those areas of interest. Mm -hmm. So an example of some success we've had with this is uh, maybe there was a, a robbery where a drone was seen being used by um, a witness or a maybe a potential criminal party, we can query that area for a specific date and time mm -hmm. to see if there was any drones flying. Or similarly, if the police got a report of a drone that they were interested in, they could query a specific date, time, and area to see what activity is without having to filter through all the different um, flights that are being detected. Like, like so, somebody flying at the Bengal, Bengals game, for example. Exactly. <laughs> it, it makes the... Um, uh, the analyzing of those events very quick yep. and you know allows them to move forward with their investigation. So here's an example of a summary. This is just going to be a general area around one of our sensors in Maryland and Baltimore specifically. Uh, you can see what we're doing is just summarizing the data here. So in this case, in this particular zone uh, between the 4th of January and today, we've seen 1,700 flights. We've seen 747 unique drones. So we obviously have multiple drones that are flying Several more times. than once, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, our max altitude of a detected drone is actually over 4,000 feet. So this may indicate a drone that has been modified to, uh, from a software perspective, Yikes. to fly higher than they're allowed to. Because most, 
you know, most of the time we know 400 feet's the limit, yeah. but with DJI drones, depending on the situation, you can usually push that up to 1600. Um, and then if you, you know, load custom firmware, you can push that even further. And that's 4,400 feet from the, the point of takeoff. Correct. Right, so <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, I, I didn't even see that number before we started. Yeah, that, that is it, that is insane. And unfortunately, this is all too common. I think one thing that um, a lot of drone pilots don't understand is the the amount of violating flights that are taking place. Right, yeah. this is not one or two instances where there's an authorized party doing a tower inspection. Right, we have sometimes hundreds of flights a day that are taking place at 1,600 feet within five miles of an airport. So wow. unfortunately, when you start to look at this data, it, it can highlight certain uh, problems that we didn't necessarily know existed, certain challenges. Yep. Yep. So some other metrics we can see, okay, how many drones flew over 400 feet? Yep. Obviously, a lot of these are gonna be authorized if they're doing a tower inspection yep. or you know flying near yeah, a tall Yeah, they're not building. necessarily bad flights, but right. it gives you an idea. But of in this case, in a month, we have over 300 um, flights that took place and over 170 uh, specific drones. We can also look at night flights as well. You know, I know more recently there's been kind of more open authorization mm -hmm. to flying at night, but uh, this, this portion of the system kind of helped us understand uh, threat level, right? If you have a lot of drones flying at night, that may indicate, um, you know, an additional metric to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. But we, then we can also see summary of drone types in most, um, excuse me, in most areas, you know, the Mavic, mini series is going to be mostly uh, detected just because it's cheap and more popular but we can analyze this information based on flight counts by hour yep. so if you're looking at a specific facility you can understand okay we need to have you know pay the most attention around these times in most cases when we run large areas of data it will average out you know near the sunset we see most of the drones flying people getting out of work and going to fly sure yeah. you know mm -hmm. uh, you know counts by day counts by week uh, and then even altitude range. So here we can see that we had 29 drones. Um, 29, 29 drones. between 1,600 and 18. So you, you have quite a lot of people. Most people are staying within the 400, few of them jumping up into you know, the four to 600. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Which again, like you said, could be a legal flight because it could be close to an absolutely. obstacle or something. Yep. Exactly. So this just kind of helps you understand the data at a high level. And then down here, we can see a heat map and a representation of all those flights that we're analyzing. Yep. Um, so this allows us to look at, um, you know, our common areas. And of course, as I zoom in, that heat map's going to adjust. So then we can see um, specific areas of the map mm -hmm. where we may have more of a drone presence. And once again, this can be applied to a small area like around a stadium or a large area like an entire county, depending on the detection coverage. So yep. uh, individual use cases definitely apply here. But as we can see, there's a lot of good information. Wow, that's impressive. So to take it a step further here, we call this the alert zone summary. It is what it's called, a summarization. We even have automated reports that can go out based on this data where once a week you're emailed with the report that we're looking at here just to kind of get an idea of the activity you're having around your mm -hmm. airspace. But if we wanted to take it a step further, we can look at the actual flight paths for all of these drones that we're talking about. So this is what we call our flight paths analysis tool. This will look at all the same data for the same zone that we just saw, but in this case, we're now looking at the specific flight paths to all these drones. So not only can you understand, okay, we had a drone flying over our stadium or near our airport, but you can see exactly what it did and when it, you know, when it flew. And of course, for any of these, I can click on um, the flight path. I can come here and look at the satellite view to um, really understand what what took Where place. Where the flight was, yeah. I have the serial number to the drone, the type of drone, its altitude range it's detected, um, and then I can even come through here and watch a live replay of that drone as it flew through time and space. So wow. uh, just really good analytics tools to come through and, and dig into. Um, it's a very good pilot. Going on. They were right below <laughs> 395 the yep, entire time. Yeah, stayed right up there, yeah. <laughs> so, you, you know, fortunately, this system does highlight challenges with drones and, and maybe some people pushing it, pushing the regulations. But what it also highlights is 95% of the time people are flying within regulation, yep. right? Well, so yep. you're flying under 400 feet or, or staying within the confines of uh, specific authorizations.
Interesting. So just to kind of dive in a little bit more too, what we can do is take this specific drone ID and query it against the database that we may have. And depending on your client access level, you know, you'll have access to a certain amount of sensors. So in this case, what I'll do is just copy this drone ID. We can go into our drone details page and this allows us to take a closer look at a specific drone. So if we had a drone of interest for whatever reason, we can come through here, query the exact serial number, and as it runs through the database, it's going to spit out a report that's specific to this drone. Of all the flights, 19 flights. Absolutely. So in this case, we outside of the one we were just looking at, we've seen 19 other detected flights with a total flight time of 406 minutes, max altitude of 574 feet. So, you know, we have some maybe instances of flying over 400. Once again, we don't know if that's authorized or not. Yep. We can see all the different areas that the uh, drone was detected. If we had access to multiple sensors, we may be able to see that. And um, So that see. would cross-reference. If you had a different detection system, it would all be captured in here, not just from one, exactly. one machine. And, and that's the benefit of this data analysis. It, we can look at similarities across geographical regions. Yep. So let's say we're, we see a suspicious drone flying at critical infrastructure. We can query the database and see, okay, have we seen this somewhere else? Obviously a drone flying near a uh, power station or nuclear plant would be of interest and in being able to very quickly see where other uh, instances of detection are, um, mm -hmm. are important. Wow. That's so, and very powerful yeah. software. And on top of that here, we have a, a map that shows all the individual flights that have taken place yep. uh, by that particular drone. So just a, yeah, another example of combining that data. So if we, we were getting detections from multiple sensors across geographical region, regions, you would see that represented you here. See it. Wow. Absolutely. One, some, I, I like to share some success stories with the data analytics. Mm -hmm. So we've had a few clients, specifically law enforcement agencies, where they are investigating a case of stolen drones, right? Mm -hmm. You have somebody who got their house broken into and their drones were stolen. So what they'll do is they'll take the stolen drone serial number and add it to our feature called the watch list. Oh. What this will do is give a specific alert when that drone is detected anywhere. Yep. Previous to this, all of our alerts were based on alert zone that we set up mm -hmm. right around a stadium, around an airport. But with this, anytime it's detected anywhere within any of the sensors you have access to in, within their detection range, you'll get a customized alert. So we've actually recovered, I want to say, over 10 drones through different police agencies by using this methodology. Wow. They add the stolen drone serial number, and sure enough, two weeks later, they get there the text is. message that we saw, and they know exactly where it's at, and then they can go talk to the operator. Maybe the operator's innocent, and he just bought the drone off Facebook Marketplace and yeah. doesn't know... Um, you know, doesn't know that there's, he's actually he's stolen has drone. stolen drones. So mm -hmm. we, we've used that uh, kind of analytics in the background to assist with those uh, type of operations. One other piece too is, you know, since we are collecting data across citywide networks, maybe there's an incident that happens, for example, at a football game. Mm -hmm. You have someone that's flying over the crowd and, you know, we're able to detect it. We can also cross-reference cross all of the historical data from that specific drone and more than likely that person has flown at their house or at other areas that might help us identify them even better. Well, Brendan, I, I so appreciate your time on this. Uh, I'm sure you guys will have questions. Please, please leave them down in the description. If we can't answer them, we'll definitely reach out uh, to you to answer those questions. I know this is going to be a popular video because uh, we get a ton of questions on, on this topic. Anything that we missed that, uh, that you might want to uh, cover in here? No, I think, you know, we looked at the majority of um, what we were interested about talking to you today. And like I said, we're more than happy to answer questions and um, kind of facilitate a further relationship as we move forward in time. Absolutely. Well, thanks for watching, guys. As always, like, subscribe, and make sure that you leave your comments. And we'll see you guys for the next video.